Welcome to Flow Stars, candid conversations between Dr. Peter O'Toole and the big hitters of flow cytometry. Brought to you by Beckman Coulter at Bite Size Bio. Today on Flow Stars, I'm joined by Paul Wallace of the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. And we discuss his pioneering and hugely influential work in the field of flow cytometry. This was the first national um, lab to offer a flow cytometry test. His favorite publication. I'm sure it's one of the one of the ones I'm most proud of is this time that I spent doing science with uh, my son Stephen. And how flow cytometry has led him all over the world. Yeah, I, I have been very fortunate, and I think many of us have been very fortunate in that uh, because of flow cytometry, I have had the opportunity to go all over the world. And who from history he'd most like to meet? Probably Jefferson uh, of the U.S. Uh, just to know what it was like back then. I think I'd like to go back far enough in time to uh, where you know society was more agricultural. All in this episode of Flow Stars. Hello, I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York, and today I'm joined by Paul Wallace, who's director of the Flow and of Flow and Image Cytometry at the Roswell Park Cancer Comprehensive Centre in Buffalo. Paul, how are you today? I'm very good, Peter. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to do this. Yeah, no, and thank you so much for agreeing to talk today. Uh, so obviously, I, I, I know of you in many ways. Uh, first and foremost, possibly, as a past Isaac president. Uh, so what was, it, what was it like being president of Isaac? How much responsibility, how much change, how much influence did you have then? Well, I, I, my first reaction to that was it was a lot of email. Uh, I, I had no idea how many emails I would end up end up getting and dealing with on a daily basis. Um, I, I can, one thing I can say is I think now many years out of being uh, past president, uh, the email the emails have slackered off a little bit, but I'm still very much involved. It was a lot of fun. It was a, it was a interesting time. Um, you know, I look back on it as we did a meeting in Asia, so we had the uh, Cyto Asia meeting uh, in Singapore. And that was that was a lot of fun, and it really opened up a lot to uh, you know Australia, New Zealand, and uh, and really Southeast Asia. Um, but then the the one thing that probably dominated it was where we had to move from being associated with FASEB, which was a, what they call an AMC or an Association Management uh, Company, and to really what eventually became a standalone. But the idea was a hybrid in there, and so migrating from where uh, one organization is doing all your taxes, accounting, your website, your databases and stuff like that, to doing it alone um, in what turned into be a relatively short time was, was a challenge. So it was, it was, it was a challenging time. Uh, and actually, uh, um, for the organization, uh, it, it, they are still going through growing pains. Yeah, so I can't believe my phone's going off in the background. We'll, we'll just carry on for now anyway. Why, why, why did you choose? What's the motivation to become president of a large society and such, such an influential society? What is the motivation? It's a lot of work. Yeah, I guess that's a good question. I'm not sure I know the answer. Um, I, what happened was Paul Robinson uh, asked me if I would run for treasurer. Uh, and I thought, well, how much trouble could I get myself into being treasurer? Uh, and uh, so I, I did that and then, uh, one thing led to another, and then I was asked to uh, become president. I thought it'd be a lot of fun to put on a meeting. I thought that would be a lot of fun. And of course, there's staff uh, that's associated with uh, with the society. And I figured, well, staff will take care of everything. And what do I? What will I need? What will I really need to do? Of course, that that was not true. But that's what I thought. Yeah. It was a lot of fun, though. I think also just for the honor and uh, you know, it was a, it was a it was a great opportunity. So when you took over, I, I think whenever there's a new incoming president of a society. They have a vision. They 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 see something. They, they would like to put a stamp on it. They, they would like to make a mark. How easy is it to actually achieve that? Because it's not you're not in presidency for a long time at Isaac. So it's quite a short short yeah, term. Just two years. Um, well, I think it is. You know, presidents have had an impact on different things. Um, and uh, but you know, I really, from a personal perspective, what I was thinking about 
was I really wanted to see uh, where we were broadening out and going into different different regions besides Europe and uh, the Americas. Uh, and so that, that was the reason for Cyto Asia. That you know that for because of, really because of COVID has slacked off. But I know that the interest is still in trying to maintain that uh, that that thing. And Rachel, who's coming in as president, really does see an opportunity to go into different regions. Um, that would just be Asia, but South America, um, Eastern Europe, and different different places. So so there's I think that has that has that has lived through. Um, you know, the others, other presidents have uh, just created more and more committees. And so um, one of the one of the jobs is usually to start going through and get getting rid of some of the committees. But uh, it's it's it goes by fast. And there's a lot of things that uh, have to get done um, that just in the normal day to day operation. So it's, it's best just to focus in on a couple things, like one or two things that you want to really want to accomplish. Yeah, uh, actually, to one, one of my, one of the Flow Stars podcasts is actually with Rachel as well, so I, I should have asked her one of those questions. Darn it! Uh, well, she's got so, she's got some ideas as well, and they're good ideas. So we we, we headed straight into you know, one of the most influential roles in flow cytometry. But what what got you interested in flow cytometry to start with? Wow, that that goes back. I'm afraid it goes back probably 35 years, maybe maybe even 40 years. Um, uh, you probably you don't you wouldn't remember this, but we used to do T cell rosettes. So we would uh, uh, rosette the T cells, um, around, uh, red cells around the, around a T cell, and then we would count the number of rosettes, which would be the number of T cells in the in the blood or in the in, in the sample. Um, and for B cells, we would come in with a, a goat anti immunoglobulin to light up the uh, light up the B cells, and you look at those under fluorescent scope. And, I didn't think the assay was very good. Um, it was, I mean, it, it was what we had at the time, uh, but it was it was pretty variable, uh, and it was awful just to go in there and count a couple hundred uh, uh, T cell rosettes, and the, the B cells were, were even more difficult because you need to, you need to know the percentage. So um, I heard about this instrument down in um, down in Philadelphia, uh, and really worked on trying to bring one into the, into the Institute. This was all before HIV. And uh, we, I got, I, I actually ended up teaming up with a group over at the research, research side of uh, Smith Klein and uh, who had just come down from Rochester from Leo Wheelis's lab. And we, uh, we basically uh, implemented a clinical assay for doing uh, uh, T cells and again, CD4s and CD8s. So, so that simple assay. Um, and I was focused on leukemias and lymphomas, so that was the, that was the way it was set up. And we get a couple a day. You know, this was a large uh, national laboratory. Um, and then uh, HIV hit, and it went from a couple a day to just you know, um, you know, 50, 60, 100 a day, and who knows what they're doing now. Um, so it was really an interest in trying to. Uh, um, move that technology into something that was um, was was more reliable and better. So, so to add to that work, I, you, know, you were one of the very first clinical flow cytometrists. I think that would be fair to say. Yeah, I, I think that's probably correct. Um, the, uh, I mean, I have an early publication with Kathy Muirhead where we're talking about comparing different lysing reagents and, and, and that type of thing, or different ways to prepare cells, you know, FICOL versus, versus lysis. Um, and you know, that was probably, that was in the very early eighties that we did that. Uh, and uh, there, were, there were labs that were, research labs that were performing flow. Uh, and there were a couple that, were, that had just started into the HIV, but um, um, it, was really a research, it was really a research assay. And very very few clinical labs that were that were doing it. certainly nothing. This was the first so um, the toot my horn. This was the first national um, lab to offer a flow cytometry assay. Which, when we think about it now, that every hospital will have flow cytometers, not a flow cytometer, but multiple, and the amount that they can turn around now is is exponentially more. <clears throat> and then, you know that wow, well, to be at the seed point for clinical flow cytometry is quite an amazing influence and just watching the proliferation I, Liam Whitby uh, so head of NEQAS uh, was talking that his whole industry is around flow cytometry 
uh, and the application in the clinical setting. So it's yeah, you know, so it's an amazing achievement that you've you've done that you've you put the first brick down. Yeah, it was the. I, you make me remember the very first uh, cytometer I had, which was an Epix five, uh, and we had hooked it up. We had done we had done some of our early work in the uh, the research facility, um, which was at a, a, a building several miles away. But when we finally got one at the clinical labs in Smith Klein, it was an Epix five. You know, it was, it was basically a jet and air sorter type of type of instrument. Uh, they did not have the uh, the analyzers that we have today, uh, and. Um, um, you know, so it was power, uh, water cooled lasers and lasers that, you know, were the uh, were six feet long. Uh, and we were next to the bathroom um, at, uh, at Smith Klein. And uh, every time somebody would go to flush the toilet, the laser would shut down. Uh, we'd have to get the instrument back up and running. So I, I was probably not the most popular person because anytime we had the uh, the, the cytometers running, we had to put a sign up on the uh, the bathrooms to go around and use another one uh, because it was every time it, it would just shut the thing down. I, I guess you weren't as plush then to have better premises. <laughs> oh, a very bad joke. I, <laughs> so moving on from, you, from getting involved into flow cytometry, uh, what what is your training to start with? What what is your undergraduate and PhD, what, what was that to get yourself into this medical world? Uh, so I uh, originally was a biology major. Um, and I think I, at that point, I was really thinking veterinary science is what I is really where I was, was thought I was headed. Um, and uh, then I ended up doing a master's in Idaho. Uh, and that was uh, really, I was it in microbiology, but I was, I really gravitated right away to immunology. And so that was my first introduction to, uh, um, you know, HLA and, and, and those types of things. And I was really struck by the fact that uh, all these cells were communicating amongst themselves. Um, there you go. We're going, we're going, this is when my wife and I are going back home to where we, uh, um, to where we, where I was in graduate school. Um, and uh, uh, you can see the sign that says, welcome to Idaho. And uh, we're obviously happy to, uh, to be back there. Um, the, the, Did you meet uh, your wife there? Is that where you met your wife? No, no. I went, met my wife. Um, she came in uh, to my, my bedroom at two in the morning um, and uh, with, a, with an old girlfriend uh, who I had dated for, the first one I had dated for, for many years. And, and this they is had, very bad already, but carry on. They had, they, had been, they had been roommates over in England. Um, so they were down in uh, Sussex. And uh, uh, when, they, when they came back, uh, Sarah, who was my, uh, my old girlfriend, wanted me to meet her roommate, uh, Betsy, who was, was, was pictured there. And uh, so two in the morning, they, they jump on the bed. And uh, that was my introduction to, uh, to, to the work. Uh, <laughs> that was that was that was my I guess my last year of college. So uh, and then uh, we ended up moving in together uh, just because we needed a place to stay. And of course, one thing led to another. Right. Obviously, worked out for the best, which is which is good. So after doing your your I think microbiology biochemistry uh, degrees, you went over to Lebanon. Is that correct? Correct. To uh, Lebanon, New Hampshire. Yeah. I said, um, uh, well, I, I ended up doing a PhD in Philly um, and then went to uh, uh, do a uh, um, postdoc at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center and uh, they were in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Um, and that was uh, basically my, my wife's idea. Um, we were living in Philly. I had been working at this company called Zenaxis, um, which had been a spinoff of Smith Klein. And uh, I went, to finish up my PhD, I had to leave Zenaxis for a period of, for a period of years, but thought I would go back to back to them. But my wife had other ideas. Um, she wanted she didn't want to live in Philly. She wanted to live in you know Vermont, New Hampshire, which is kind of where she spent her summers. And uh, so she arranged for me to interview for a postdoc at Dartmouth, um, and then uh, I think probably drove me up there. Uh, I went through the interview and. I guess that went well because I ended up spending almost 10 years at, uh, at Dartmouth. I don't think it's often that many wives actually try and find their husbands a job and, and say, oh, just, just go for this job interview because that's where I want to live. That, that, that's, 
<laughs> yeah. well, I, I, I think the piece in looking back on it was she actually picked a, uh, um, a, a postdoc that was a good fit for me. And so how she actually knew that, I have no, I have no idea. It probably was just lucky. It is very impressive. Impressive. You mentioned Zinaxis. So, so you, you know, you've been on the dark side. Is that, is that the right way to word it? You've, you've been out of academia, you've worked in industry. Tell me a bit about your time within Zinaxis. So Zinaxis was a spin-off, as I think I said, uh, from Smith Klein. And at Smith Klein, we had developed uh, the group that I was working with, I was pretty much focused on the clinical assays, but the group I was working with had developed these dyes, the PKH dyes, and these are lipophilic dyes that stably insert into the membrane of, uh, of cells. And uh, we all wore many, many different hats. I was in charge of IT and the, the phone systems and uh, also the immu immunological development. And I had gone down to, so we, we made, we basically made the dyes and uh, we were trying to turn this into a pharmaceutical company uh, with the idea that we would use the dyes to, uh, uh, well, one of the ideas was that we leave, leave, put them into a catheter. And then as people were doing stents, we could uh, leave the dye behind. It would then uh, adhere to the, the, the vessels and it would inhibit the, uh, we'd put an inhibitor on it of proliferation so that you could, uh, inhibit the, the development of the uh, the plaque. I was working uh, on TILs, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and I was down at NIH as, as a uh, partnership or collaboration with the folks at NIH. And we, our idea was to put a nucleotide on the TILs, or all, well, on the linker and then attach it to the TILs, and then allow the TILs to migrate to the tumor and uh, then we could irradiate it and um, basically kill, kill the tumor from within. Um, and so there was a mouse model we were working with and uh, um, I stained the tills up with this nice bright dye, PKH26, uh, in, inject them into the tumor bearing mice. And then a week later I'd pull them out and the damn things were be really dim. I mean, I had put them in and they were, they were bright red um, and I'd pull them out and they were dim. And I, I to do what anybody else would do. I went in and I put more dye on them so that they would uh, be even brighter. And then I pulled them out and they were dim. And so I didn't think of this, but somebody else said, you know, maybe, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that, maybe there's a, a positive thing there. Um, and uh, so what, what do you mean? It was, well, maybe what's happening is that the, the cells are dividing and uh, what's happening is the dye is being diluted out amongst the, uh, amongst the, uh, the daughters. And of course, that's exactly what would happen. And then out of that uh, came an assay that was what was at the time was called the cell census plus assay, where we would uh, label the cells up with uh, with a dye, stimulate them in vitro, and then uh, pull them out and run them on a flow cytometer. Um, but I, I I have to give somebody else credit for actually seeing the potential there because I, I was just annoyed that these things were uh, were, were dim. I wanted them to be as bright as possible. And then you have a self. Uh, so that was that was an access. That access was really a good was it was a good experience. I would highly recommend that anybody um, who is uh, uh, you know going into getting started go work at a startup because that's a, that's really an that's an exciting time. I, I think I'd be tempted to say, if, you, if you're interested in getting an experience, go, go work for yourself, because you sent me this picture as uh -oh. well, which, which <laughs> I did this, uh, it tell, is it Halloween, or what is going on with this picture? So this is uh, the group at uh, where I am now at Roswell. Um, it's got to be a Halloween, and we've got everybody uh, dressed up in, uh, well, we've got everything from ninjas to witches. I'm not sure what Kieran's wearing, but that looks to me like Frankenstein in the middle there. Uh, Hans is the guy with the hat and the beard. Uh, and then uh, Ed with the lasers, big, what, I don't know, what's this, big something laser. Um, do not look into the beam with the remaining eye. Um, Ed is our engineer. So this was, the, we, we've had, Roswell has been a fun place and we've had, a, we've had a fun time. And this is basically, uh, uh, a, one of many shots of the Halloween that we all, all got dressed up and, and enjoyed. Yeah. A good lab spirit, I presume. I, I think so. I mean, we've actually, uh, the staff that I, all these people, with the exception of um, one who's retired or are still here now, uh, this, we've had a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of history with this group. 
I've got to say, I'm just looking at the guy with the, bl the blue jacket. Looks a bit like Ed Sheeran, uh, <laughs> UK art artist. <laughs> it's just uh, he does all. He writes all our templates, so puts together all our templates in Excel. Uh, smart guy. That's Matt. Uh, and uh, I'm not. What is that? I, I should know better. But what's that on his shoulder? Uh, a Tamagotchi or something. It's I, I'm the, not the best to ask. It's uh, one of those cartoon characters. Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm not the best to ask either. Is it Pokemon? <laughs> Pokemon? I don't, Pokemon? Maybe there's a Pokemon. Uh, that could be one of those. Pokemon, Pokemon, I think. Uh, so, and they did this voluntarily. You didn't sort of just hypnotize oh, them. Oh, this is Mark Monson. So uh, this was at a Glyphka. Um, Peter, you know, you know anything about that Glyphka? It's the no. Great Lakes International Imaging and Flow Cytometry Association, uh, which is basically, as the name says, it's any flow lab in the Great Lakes uh, that touches a Great Lake. And th there's been some leniency to that definition over the, over the years because um, we've had people from Massachusetts and uh, Virginia. And so it, it has migrated to any place where there is water that has touched in a Great Lake. Um, so I, I, I suspect that means that you could be a, a member of Glyphka as well. But that was a picture of, uh, of Mark uh, and there was a contest, there's a party, a big party every, every Glitka, and a contest to see who had the most um, interesting or outrageous uh, costume. Right. And I, I, those, those, those glasses were wild. <laughs> so on a more serious note, or maybe not that serious a note, coming back to work a bit, what is your favorite publication that you've authored and co-authored and, and why was that your favorite? Not necessarily the, the, the biggest impacting, but for whatever reason, what is your favorite publication? That's a, that's, I mean, I, you know, you get into all your uh, all your publications and uh, enjoy them. I, I guess, um, you know, what we're working on right now is multiple multi myeloma MRD. So um, done a lot of work in in that area. And there's a postdoc here who's who's uh, working working on that with me. Um, and um, you know, that's been that that working with him has been a, a great experience. I, I kind of feel that we made it a pretty substantial impact. Um, and I mean, back uh, when Liam was is involved in this as well, trying to standardize uh, the assay, the multiple myeloma MRD assay across multiple, uh, multiple countries, multiple, multiple labs. And so that to me, that's, I'm sure when I look back on it, that will be, uh, uh, a major one I, you know another one that comes to mind and i'm going to get up and walk away for a second but another one that comes to mind is a fox p3 assay um so it was an early fox p3 assay and on the uh can you see that okay well, uh, i can see cytometry b yep yeah this was this publication uh which was on the cover of cytometry b uh, was one that I did with my son. So my son came here to work for oh, about. Yeah. Uh, about just us again. Paul, just show us again. Just lift it a bit higher so we can actually see. Yeah, uh, let me. Uh, the whole. You tell me if I, I don't have my camera on, so I really can't. Yeah, see. That, that's good. Yeah. So this was basically uh, something that I did with my son um, where we were looking at, uh, at uh, C127, Fox P3, and basically. Uh, published it together in Cytometry B. So I, I'm sure it's one of, the, one of the ones I'm most proud of is this time that I spent doing science with uh, my son, Stephen, who saw the, the grant writing stuff and uh, the amount of hours that went into this and decided he didn't want to have anything to do with it. Although he was accepted in the graduate program, uh, he didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so now he's, uh, he's a doctor out in Ohio, uh, which I guess is he, he thinks is a much easier life had then had it been a uh, flow cytometrist. <clears throat> who's more important? The doctor who's uh, diagnosing and prescribing or the scientist who's developing the assays and the treatments? Oh, um, I, I mean, I, I we may have to beep this out, but because uh, I really think that uh, the, the guy that's the, the doc who's doing the, the treatments, um, Basically, they're following an algorithm, and uh, it's it's all pretty much step by step. Whereas the scientist really has to think through and experiment and do do different things. So I, I I'm I'm glad that I went down the route of the of the the, the scientist because I would think that after a while 
you see the same patients with the same diseases over and over again, it would, it would get boring. Although I'm sure there's a, the, 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 you know, that the, being able to uh, help people is, is certainly very significant as well. But you, both sides are, are, uh, are helping. If you think about the assays that you've helped design or designed and published and now used clinically to diagnose, they couldn't do that without that effort behind the scenes. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's definitely correct. I just wish that I'd gotten a penny for every time the test was performed. Um, a lot of it went back in the industry. Uh, you know, that would all go back into Smith Klein's coffers. And there was a there was an assay that I developed there. This was this was an ELISA assay. Um, that was for Lyme disease. So long before Lyme was even the, even something anybody had heard of, um, I had read an article in the Journal of Infectious Disease, and I knew there was somebody at the state labs who was working on the bug. And so uh, we, we teamed up and I basically put together an immunofluorescent assay for, for Lyme disease. And then Lyme disease started appearing on the, the, the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, you know, Time Magazine, all that stuff. And before you knew it, we were doing hundreds and hundreds of Lyme tests a day at the at Smith Smith Klein. Um, we ended up creating a whole lab just to, just to do the testing and looking at automation. And at one point, they were considering to changing the name of Smith Klein to Smith Lyme, um, as but uh, apparently they did not. <laughs> but I, I I look back at that. I go, Gosh, I wish I'd had a penny for each one of those. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a very big influence so obviously your career has been hugely successful you've you know gone through you've had lots of influence lots of impacts you know which people won't even know to be thankful to you about because again it's kind of the hidden hidden people behind the doctors and the clinicians at that point but it, it sounds all great we've seen your lab having a fun time we've seen that the conferences can be good fun what have you found the most difficult time or most challenging time so far in your career well, I, I guess the beginning and at the end. Um, the beginning when I was doing, uh, when I was you know, doing my, really working my PhD. Oh no, even before that, when I was working my master's, I had this, I had this uh, uh, project where the idea was to look at graft versus host disease. Um, and um, uh, so it was, a, it was a, actually it was, I look back on it, it was probably, more work went into my master's than into my PhD at times. And the idea was that we were looking at different populations of cells. These, these populations turned out to be uh, CD4 and CD8, but it was before we knew what a CD4 was or what a CD8 was. And so we were looking at different synergistic interactions between uh, the different, these different populations of cells. And uh, one of the things I wanted to look at was their effect or their impact on graft versus host disease. And the way that assay was set up is you would put different, you, you'd take a nude mouse, which had no, no T cells, um, and then you would inject in different, different numbers of these different populations, wait a little while, then come in with, a, uh, um, with something that was allogeneic, allogeneic spleen cells. And then a, a, a day or two later, probably three or four days later, we would look at the proliferation by injecting tritiated thiamine in, in the tail vein of the mouse. And it's a, it sounded like a complicated assay. It was a complicated assay. I could not get it to work, but my my entire career rested on being able to get some data off of this. At least that's how you felt. So it was it, it was tough um, in the sense that as an inpatient youth, I um, um, was forced to really uh, think through things and and deal with failure and to uh, really adjust to, uh, you know, how, how am I, how am I going to fix it? Um, and I, that was not, that was definitely was not easy. The idea of experiments not working well after, you know, weeks of planning and weeks of executing them. So that, that was a difficult lesson for me personally to, to learn. Um, eventually I came up with a different assay, uh, which was using the mixed lymphocyte reaction, which is basically doing the whole thing in, in vitro. Um, but that process uh, was difficult. And if I can, Peter, I, I'll tell you at the end, um, which is really where I am now of my career, because um, I, I think, you know, I'm thinking about retirement. Uh, it's letting things go. So after having uh, managed, you know, the, this facility for 20 years, um, we have, you know, the, the, the people who uh, 
have been trained and are more than competent, but then let them actually make the decisions and turn it over to turn it over to them. I think is probably the uh, is is probably the second hardest thing that I've done because I, I always want to tell them no this I don't really want to tell them, no this is <laughs> Uh, this is the way you will do it. Uh, of course, that's that that's uh, backing off and letting people learn learn for themselves was uh, something you have to do, but it, it, that's tough as well. Okay, so you said you're coming up to retirement then. So I was going to ask you what you do to relax outside of work, but I, actually I'm going to change it now. So when you've got time on your hands, what are you going to do? Well, um, I think I think you know this, but we bought a house in Sedona, Arizona. Um, and uh, um, so we're planning on sort of splitting our time between uh, Sedona and here. What I what I enjoy doing a lot is uh, is hiking. So I'll uh, uh, I'm sure I will be out there. I know I'll be out there um, going for uh, for regular hikes. That's actually just outside the. Uh, so this picture is of uh, um, I guess of myself and. Uh, uh, what you're looking at is is basically coffee pot. So this is a, uh, a red stone um, cliffs just just literally um, behind our house. Uh, and you know I've been out there uh, quite a bit, and we've, I've hiked up back into those uh, into those mountains and those hills and behind them. And uh, that's I'm sure that that's a big part of it. Another big part of it is spending time with my kids. Um, that's something that I I. I'd very much like to do with the grandchildren. Um, so I, I think that, and then I'm, I've got a garden going here in, uh, in Buffalo uh, and uh, been thinking about chickens. Um, I, I, I will still be associated with, the, with uh, Roswell. So I'll, I'm envisioning myself doing some uh, work for Roswell as well. So keep him busy. Uh, uh, sure. I, I, I actually, um, I have no doubt that uh, that I'll be busy, um, it'll, but it'd be nice if I could reduce it down to like 40 hours a week and just five days, a, five, <laughs> five, five days a week. Which is a good comment, actually. They sent some other pictures that these just touching through these quite quickly. We've got yourselves here. Uh, the, so this is this is in. Uh, um, uh, Chile, I guess, or Argentina, but it was those. That that's Patagonia. So that's the that's that is Patagonia, which is um, a vacation that my wife and I took. Um, it's a beautiful lake, and uh, uh, that was a that was a fun time. That was, but uh, again, that's off hiking and doing uh, doing stuff. A great Wall of China. Really much description does it? Even I can guess that this is a Great Wall of China. Yeah, you know, I think I think um, the reason for this picture was really just in thanks to uh, to flow cytometry. Um, yeah, I, I have been very fortunate, and I think many of us have been very fortunate in that uh, because of flow cytometry, I have had the opportunity to go all over the world. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it's teaching, uh, uh, training people on how to use the cytometers, but really at every continent. Um, I've been I've been been invited to, and this was this was this was China. I believe this was a live education task force that we were doing um, in uh, in Beijing. Uh, but been there been there a couple times. And one of the things that I promised myself when I became president of ISAC was that I would always go if I, any place that I went to, I would then tack on like two or three days of uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, touring and again, this is the um, the tomb with all the all the soldiers. Uh, this is this is probably one of the one of the nicer places I saw. But you can see that there's a horses down there, and then the uh, those are those are the the generals with that type of that type of hairdo. Um, it's just a shame that it got ruined. So it's it, 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 so uh, it was great. I was showing those actually. Show you. Obviously, you've got a great passion for traveling, and I'm sure you, you will do more traveling as well. But you also touched on the fact that it's not just going to conferences, but you're out there teaching, running courses. And that's a very important aspect. You developed assays, you're a leader in the field of clinical uh, research and clinical diagnosis. But do you want to just describe the importance of teaching? Surely this is easy. You can just pick up a scientific paper, grab a flow cytometer and run it. No? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I, I think you know the answer to that as well. Uh, 
There are a lot of people who feel that way, and there are a lot of people who 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 do it and don't get any don't get any data. But uh, I think I think um, all my all really all my life I've been involved in some sort of some sort of teaching, and that much of it, uh, you know, is certainly engaged in uh, with flow cytometry. And uh, so we've we've put together uh, uh, the live education. So we're that, that we're doing courses in India. We're doing courses in uh, in Vietnam. You know, it, I guess if I was to weave that into a story, um, one of the things that was was became very important with HIV was uh, that you know getting all those antiretrovirals out to uh, third third world countries, developing nations, uh, and. Uh, you know, one of the things that the U.S. did was to create this presidential fund that was then used to uh, pay for the medication. So you're sending all this medication uh, into uh, Nigeria or into or into Africa, and uh, when you when do you actually deliver it? So you have to know what the CD4 count was in order to make a decision as to whether or not that patient is going to. Uh, uh, it's time for that patient to be put on antiretroviral. So nobody had any idea how to do CD4 testing. So while we can be really helpful on the, in terms of providing medication, the next step was to engage uh, people in, ter in terms of doing the proper testing. And so introducing uh, flow cytometry in, in Africa was something that really required a lot of education, a lot of training. And basically the philosophy was to train the trainers. So you would go in, you do a training program, Teach people how to how to teach this stuff, and then they they go out into the bush and uh, and uh, train people how to do it. You know, now uh, I think one of the things I'm really proud of is the fact that here at Roswell we have a graduate level course that we offer each semester, primarily to the immunology students, but it's open to uh, the, you know, the the University of Buffalo community. And we have uh, we go through a, basically a semester training in how to do flow cytometry. Everything from you know what a flow cytometer is to what's good experimental design. Then they have practicals that they that they do, uh, and uh, it's a four-hour credit. So it's a it's a you know a, a lot of credits. Or it's the immunology has made it mandatory for all of their students. I think this is probably the only. Uh, oh, send me an email if, you're, if anybody else is doing one. Uh, but uh, I think it's probably the only course out there that is a graduate level uh, course de dedicated to flow, flow cytometry. Yeah, no, Dave, certainly at York, we, we don't do that at, at York. There, there is an element of flow cytometry and the undergraduates come and use our flow cytometers for one of the modules. Uh, but we do run a lot of external courses, uh, which internals can come to, because I think the important bit maybe missed out of that, which your courses do, it, is in, it inspires people to go on. and. It, it can give people, if they can realize flow cytometry can be a career. And there's a still a very fast and very diverse set of applications that flow cytometry can do. I think that's so important that I think delivery, teaching and delivering on courses is one of the most influential ways that we can develop other people's careers. I think it's tremendous. And when it comes to Africa, there's a big thing at the moment, even at York, that we're leading a project with four other countries in East Africa uh, so they're actually being to us a teach teach trainer just just as you said right. yep. uh, but actually as soon as we're allowed to again because obviously times have been difficult in the last couple of years uh, we'll hope to get back over there uh, because then we can teach far more people and far more trainers than possible to bring over to the UK uh, so they all have the same cytometers they're all just as talented it's just yeah I, I think as a group of people you can influence far better than yeah, there's no, there's no question there is a, uh, a you know, it, it can influence people's careers in flow cytometry. And um, I mean, I, you know, we certainly have a, have a history of doing that here. And people who have e e taken the courses uh, uh, and uh, gone on and, uh, you know, gone to work in labs or going to even start up their own SRL. Uh, and it's also the quality of the data, just ensuring that people understand what good data is about. One of my, uh, favorite lines was when somebody would come in and they they would uh, ask me what it, what does this mean and I would I would say well what, what what do you want it to mean we can make it look any way you want it to look um, and uh, you know with flow it's it's all 
uh, you know, depending on where you set your voltages and how you set up your conversation and all, all of that, you know, you can get any type of data you want. Um, and, uh, and so you really need to know what's, what's, how to do it correctly. I don't so think there's ever any end of that. <laughs> we touched on uh, inspiring people, but who have been your inspirations? Oh, um, there have been a lot. Um, actually, quite a, quite a few. Of course, Paige Morhan was my mentor in uh, when I was doing my PhD, and she really taught me how to ask questions and and think about things not so much and just I want to do this, but to, how am I going to do it and uh, what's what's the question that I'm trying to ask and to forget all the other stuff that uh, sort of that comes along to really how to focus. Um, you know, there's Kathy Muirhead who I mentioned earlier with the. She was very much involved with the uh, the dyes, and it's been a, in my career. We've been working together probably for for thirty thirty five years, uh, and so we have we have sort of moved together through a lot of things. She's very much involved in ISAC now. Uh, she can blame me for engaging her in that. She's very detail oriented. She's working on the policies and procedures. Um, uh, Kathy's a, a dear friend, um, and really a lot of my mentors have gone on to become dear friends. Uh, one person I, I really think of when you ask the question though is a, a gentleman named Carlton Stewart. And Carlton was also uh, very much involved in clinical flow cytometry. I, 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 when I was doing my PhD, Paige would say, I'd go to her with a question and she'd say, oh, go call Carl, go call Carl. And I, so I'd, I'd call Carl. Usually he wasn't there, but he would return the call that day. Uh, and we'd get into a long discussion uh, you know, 45 minutes to an hour over the phone talking about different things to do the flow cytometer. Uh, and, you know, this guy in my mind, you know, I'm a student, he was a guy. I mean, he was, he was, he was definitely a superhero. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we ended up communicating. And then uh, there's a Bowdoin flow cytometry course, which is a research course that's, I think it's in its 40th year or 42nd year or something like that, um, which I was invited to, uh, to teach at. Um, and I'm down in the cafeteria, and in walks Carl. It's the first time I've ever met him um, in person. We, we talked, and I certainly knew what he looked like from pictures. But he, and he sits down in front of me, and um, we, we introduce ourselves. Like, oh, I think we both knew who each other was. And this, I'm just really, really excited. I'm talking to the, the god, my god of flow cytometry. And he turned around and told the raunchiest joke you have, you have ever heard. Yeah. Uh, it was it was hilarious, uh, but it, it definitely knocked knocked me for a loop. And uh, uh, you know, we got to be very good friends at the at, at the course, uh, and I always look forward to uh, meeting him um, at that. And then at one point, he called me up and asked if I would apply for the job here at Roswell. And uh, of course, I did, and uh, ended up uh, following in his footsteps. But there was a period of probably um, six months to nine months where we were working on things together. He was he was telling me who to avoid in the administration and how, why he did this this way. And uh, we got we were out to dinner a couple times a week with ourselves and our wives. And uh, I just became a very good friend with them to the point where we were when he after he did leave. I, he was coming back and staying with me, or I'd be out. He was in uh, New Mexico, staying with staying with them. So he went from being uh, somebody that I was impressed that would return my phone calls uh, to really a superhero to a very very close friend. And I, so I, Carl, um, he taught me a lot. Definitely taught me a lot. You do realize I'm now really curious to know what the joke was, but it's probably not right. To I, 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 I thought about it, um, but it probably is not a good idea to tell this. I quite often ask at the end of uh, one of these, what's your favorite science joke? But I think I've been warned off doing that. I don't think it's had anything to do with science. <laughs> probably genitalia. So, that type of thing. This is a question now, which is, I, you know, I've not tried. Who would you, dead or alive, science or non-science, who would you most like to meet? Who would I most like to meet? Oh my goodness! Um, uh, I, I, when I think about that type of thing, I, it's sort of like I really I don't know if there's a person, although maybe Jefferson or one of the one of the, the presidents of the uh, the probably Jefferson uh, of the U.S. Uh, just to know what it was like back then. I think I'd like to go back far enough in time 
to uh, where you know society was more agricultural and um, things things were on that line. Um, you know, that's that's the person that comes to my mind right off is Thomas Jefferson, who was I think the third president of the U.S. Yeah. Uh, so that's a very good answer. I've got to say, actually, I, I do another podcast series called The Microscopist, and Ernst Delser became a physicist because he wanted to invent a time machine to go back to see people yeah. who, to see what the time was like, what it was really like to live at those periods of time. I mean, I, you know, if, if I had the opportunity, I would, you know, uh, Jefferson is certainly the person I would most like to meet, although uh, uh, in, in, in that response, but really I'd like to be able to go back to, uh, uh, you know, even Stone Age, uh, just, just to understand what what things are like over have been over the, um, the years yeah the flow cytometers weren't as uh, advanced back then so so quick, so quick fire questions for you uh so what's your favorite food my favorite food um i i as a as a, a genre i really like indian food so that i just i love going to india and eating the food there and just today uh, uh a lady uh brought in some uh, um it's a chickpea plus uh, plus chicken that uh, just smells good with all the spices in when i think of it probably there's a curried cauliflower uh, that i loved loved to love to eat there but other than that you know i'm happy with steaks and uh, <laughs> chips yeah but no, no, no even the curry cauliflower even sounds good okay what food do you most dislike um i was i I absolutely despise liver. Um, I, okay. I did not. I, I have. I have never uh, liked liver, and I think of it as the cesspool of the body. Um, so I never. Okay. Never really... Kidneys or liver? <laughs> Do I have a choice? Definitely be a kidney, uh, but <laughs> but neither. I'm about to say because surely kidneys are worse than liver. Surely, surely. <laughs> can't be. It can't. It can't. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I personally. Um, I've always wondered what's in a steak and kidney pie. Um, and you would, I, you'd know better than I. It's not something that we eat here in the States. Thank yeah, God. yeah, you get the kidneys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, not my cup of tea. Definitely not. Talking of which, coffee or tea? Um, actually, I don't, I, I don't drink either now. Uh, I used to drink, uh, well, I used to drink coffee, but I would come into work and I'd be so excited um, you know, after my fourth mug of coffee that I decided it probably was time to, to slack off on that. And I switched over to tea, um, which I would drink, drink a little bit, but these, these, these days I don't drink that much tea. Um, so usually for me, it's like some, some seltzer water or something like that. Okay, so beer or wine? Uh, beer. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I knew you were going to say that answer, <laughs> judging by the pictures you sent. Yeah, I, I, this is uh, this is in uh, uh, Prague, uh, where they had this absolutely delicious beer, uh, and uh, you know I don't, I honestly I don't remember the name of it, but uh, but it's it's they would they would uh, not only have it on in a kegs, but they also had it in uh, in uh, containers. That they would fill up every day and this is this is from one of those my wife is uh impressed by this i think um this is probably a leader with a uh, a good head but probably an, in, an inch or so of uh, of foam on the top and you know Prague was drinking beer uh that was that was a it was definitely a good thing okay so <laughs> moving on to the next uh a book or tv uh, these days, it's mostly books on tape. Um, you know, uh, I don't watch too much TV, uh, but I do listen to you know do listen to a lot of a lot of books. And I sort of envision myself. Um, we were talking about retirement. I sort of envision myself reading a, reading a lot more. Uh, what what it, now? It's mostly the journals and the uh, you know the, the manuscripts and, and that type of thing. So, so what reading. Genre? What, 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 what type of books do you read? What's the genre? Um, but what, I, I sort of bounce back and forth. I'll do a lot of history, uh, and then I'll move into these thrillers. You know, where uh, the, the um, SEAL Team Six is coming in and saving saving the day, or something along that line. So I I go back I go back and forth between that. But, and I went basically I just go through stages. Um, I'll uh, the, some of the natural history um, books about uh, ants or about uh, just finished one on ravens that I very much enjoyed, um, and just how smart the ravens are. Okay. <clears throat> Favorite movie? 
favorite movie. Um, uh, probably the Star Wars, I guess, would be the uh, one that would. One that would <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sound like your favorite um but that was that was exciting um uh, you know i remember i was at, working my master so you know i'm in, in my very early 20s uh, and the very first star wars came out and that was such a revolutionary uh, approach to, to to movies um that uh you know it definitely it definitely had an impact on me um i don't know about so much about the latter ones but uh, i was about to say do you like the latest ones um, I don't really pay as much attention to them. Um, you know, I've always been tempted. Well, maybe someday I'll sit down and binge on uh, on Star Wars, uh, but I've yet to do that. I, I think probably the first two or three were, were ones that I that, that I enjoyed. Oh, you'll have to give it a go. You you'll have to give it a go. What about music? Well, what, what about? I'm sorry, Peter. What, what about you? Um, I, you... See, 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 I, as a Star Wars, see, I'm more of a Star Trek person than Star Wars. And I'm not sure the two ever really coexist in people. I love both. So I'm definitely more of a Trekkie than a Star Wars person. I just finished a book. Um, it was basically the Three Body Problem, uh, which is which is a scientific book, a science fiction book, uh, and it's about the uh, it's a, a it's a planet up in the Andromeda strain that's uh, got three different stars, and the stars are all because of the gravitational pull of all of them. There's nothing consistent about it, uh, and they're basically they're looking at their world ending and so they've uh they've located earth and they're going to be on they would go on their way to earth and uh that was a you know so i do i do like the science fiction and i would i could although i think of uh of uh star trek is more of a tv show although granted there's plenty of, there's plenty of uh movies. that's another that would be another genre that i like as well um and i don't know if they coexist um but they're yeah i, I it's probably just one of those legacy things when i was growing up for it. What about the music? What, what's your favorite? Type of music? I go through uh, um, different different things there. Um, you know, certainly when I was younger, it was rock and roll. Um, and uh, these days, uh, I'll listen to, uh, um, uh, well, the, the group that comes to my mind right off is Buckethead. Um, but this is basically like more space um, electronic type of music. I like it. Yeah, I could cope with that. It's much better than Star Wars. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to, to come back into the more serious side, at the moment uh, in flow cytometry, a big thing is spectral flow cytometry. Uh, something that microscopists have had for a little while, uh, cytometry is getting to grips with. Do you think there's still a reluctance to accept spectral flow cytometry? Um. We have we have a spectral here, uh, and uh, you know I'm a, a big fan of it. I certainly think that that's where uh, what the, the future is, and I, I I'm convinced of that. Um, I do think that uh, in terms of your your norm your average person that comes in to uh, to do flow cytometry, they're not looking for challenges. They they basically have things that are that are setting up, and they have it. It's working well. They're comfortable with it. In fact, anytime we pull out a laser and put a new laser and tell them they have to uh, reestablish their, their voltages and controls, they, they, they get upset with us. Um, but uh, um, but truthfully, I, I think that spectral is the uh, the future. And so what you've got, what you've put up here is uh, this was a this is a spectral cytometer. It was in Kylie Price's lab in New Zealand. Um, and at this point, it's it's a, she, it, it's a three laser. They were upgrading it to uh, to a, a fourth laser. Um, and uh, it's the, basically the inside workings of it. And you know what I what I think of when I when I see this is just how far we've come. I mean, I mentioned at the start about we had this uh, instrument with six foot lasers. It was water cooled, and here you're looking at something with with it's got SciTech on it, uh, three four one eight. And it, those are those are lasers of that this thing that have just been shrunk down to just tiny little tiny little uh, tiny little things uh, in the back or the AP is the APD array. And there, you know, that, that you're looking at, uh, uh, depending on the, the channel, but like 16 different uh, different detectors. You know, that was just unimaginable. So the technology is just amazed amazes me as where where it's gone. I think this was, um, um, and you know, so it really it really is absolutely amazing. I think flow uh, 
it developed, it developed fast, but then it slowed down, I would say, for some years. It, each new system was a, maybe an extra laser and other few detectors. It wasn't groundbreaking. I think Spectrum has opened up. It's a big step forward, I think. So yeah, this has been made, but this is basically SciTech, who I think we all know uh, started off sort of doing repairs and then uh, went, went, into, went into the Spectral big time. Uh, but but frankly, uh, you know, it's, it's not one of the major manufacturers, or, or well, they become a major manufacturer. But so it's taken these types of uh, these types of leaps. Haven't really been done by the uh, the, the BDs and the Beckman Coulters. Um, it's been the the ones off to the off to the side. Even uh, you think about the. Uh, uh, Beckman, you know, they've got a great line with the Cytoplex, but that was something that I can remember it being at uh, um, at an ISAC meeting where it was sort of a prototype, um, a different concept, um, and everybody was drooling over the fact that here was a really, really interesting instrument. So, um, you know, it's the I think it's the innovators uh, that are really responsible for a lot of these big leaps that that you see here. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question: that Why do you think it is that BD and Coulter didn't develop their own spectral analyzer in time because it's been there. The tech, they knew about the technology. They can see it in other fields. Why? Why did they not? I, honestly, I, I, I think um, it's what we're comfortable with. I mean, with the with the Cytoflex, I mean, you're really approaching a lot of different, I'm not sure, is it 25 or, or so different uh, channels that you can you can achieve. And that's probably not too much different than this this uh, three laser that she's got uh, here. Uh, yeah, I think people become comfortable with the technology. There's also regulations, so you you get something that's got the IBD um, the, 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 the CE label on it, and it's a lot of work to go through that whole process again. So I think I think there's a reluctance um, to to go off and. To, something that's completely new but frankly i don't understand there's a lot of there's um you know i think obviously bd had uh some some insights into spectral what they thought they could do it better with uh with bandpass filters uh and i think i think they're they're, they're learning differently you gotta be happy about it i mean you gotta be happy that everybody's challenging different things uh you know the um, the stuff that went, went on in, in Boulder with Cinemation. I mean, there, there's lots of good things that have come out of um, the innovators. No, and I think there's a lot more. I, I think we're going to see a very rapid period of development uh, as technology moves forward to enable new things, which maybe wasn't there as well 10, 15 years ago. You think I, about the fluorochromes. I mean, the, what's going on with fluorochromes? I mean, you know, for, for decades we were stuck with Fitzy, then PE came in and, and you know, you look at the, uh, the figures that, you know, Mario's published this, uh, where you just see the logarithmic growth in the number of fluorochromes. And, you know, I thought, well, when we get the BVs and the, uh, the BUVs, you know, things are gonna, maybe we're, we're pretty much uh, tapped out. But no, I mean, every time you turn around, there's another, there's another fluorochrome that uh, yep. is gonna fit. So it seems almost like you can create, and I think this is true, it's, you can create an instrument uh, with so many channels and then you can uh, uh, turn around and uh, develop a fluorochrome that'll be good for that particular channel. Uh, yeah, and, and beyond the visible range now, as we go right out, you know, I, I've got a Cytoplex system and that that's, you know, the 808 on that and pushing yep. it. But as you say, I, I'll, I'll go turn this around now, you mentioned how the lasers have got smaller and smaller and smaller, but, uh, that's as you go forward in time, they've been able to miniaturize things, but I presume this is you. So actually, I think I've just miniaturized you by going back in time. So, got yeah, so this is um, myself uh, and my sister, uh, Carol. Um, I probably am like five or so in this picture. Uh, that's, a, that's a Ford, uh, I guess just a Ford, a blue Ford that my, uh, my parents had. I, I guess it's Easter. Um, and... Uh, you know, long before seatbelts, my sister Carol, she used to take like to take off all her clothes, and uh, she would sit in the back of the car, up up between the uh, the back window, and there was a platform that I guess was above the trunk, uh, and uh, uh, it's completely naked, just sun sunbathing yourselves in the in the back seat. So when I see this picture, and I and I think of her, that's that's the, the definitely the memory I have. But we must have been. She's got a little white gloves on. She's um, real happy. We we both. Out to the red. I still like red. Um. <laughs> oh, sorry, I flicked to the wrong picture on that one. But you also sent these pictures. Is this? This is Niagara Falls. Um, 
in just you know about a half hour north of Buffalo. Uh, this is kind of a nice shot with the uh, the rainbow. And then uh, Marina is the uh, is the lady uh, pictured here, and she had come over from Bosnia to uh, do some training in, in flow cytometry. She's an MD PhD, uh, and had a lab in uh, in Bosnia that uh, they were trying to uh, sort of upgrade to the, the next level. And she had written a grant to ICCS uh, to uh, come over and, and, and do, some, do some training with us. Um, so this, we, I, one of the things that anybody who comes to Buffalo, um, I'm happy to, happy to do is take them out to the falls. And I've got a nice walk that I like to do, but that's a, I think that would be the, um, the, uh, the the Vale Falls. So it, 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 it brings it around sort of full cycle, really, as to do you know, back to training and influencing and everything else. I realise actually, I think flow, definitely a lot of flow in that picture. Uh, <laughs> but you know, with the with the with the falls, um, oh, they have it down. They have they have figured out exactly how much water they need to let over the uh, over the falls uh, in order to make it look spectacular. Uh, but the uh, most of it is all underground and being pumped up uh, and going through uh, um, systems to generate electricity. That, it, which actually was sort, of, sort of leads to the next point. So, so actually, we are up to the hour, so I, I have to be conscious. So you give me a lot. I'm sorry we haven't got all through your pictures or even all your hobbies, your ice hockey team and stuff. But I would like to leave it on a slightly more serious note. We talked about technology there uh, with the spectrum. We talked about technology at Niagara Falls. What do you see as the next big challenge or the next big development area for cytometry? So for cytometry, I think the next big challenge is probably global warming. Uh, uh, and that would be uh, really for all of us. Uh, I don't know if there's a role for flow cytometry in global warming. Um, uh, maybe trying to figure out uh, how to make zero carbon uh, lasers. Um, well, you, you, you've, I was about to say those those smaller lasers are also sap a lot less energy as well. They're much more energy efficient. So actually, maybe they are contributing. Those six foot lasers with the water yeah. chillers, the pumps, <laughs> the energy, the heat they were dissipating were very inefficient compared to what we have today. Yeah, both here at Roswell and certainly back at the Smith Klein days, we had dedicated uh, power coming. You know, these two twenty lions that were, were coming in and uh, were all isolated specifically for the for the instruments. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think the uh, I, I guess what I what I what concerns me the most about flow cytometry, uh, what I think the biggest challenge is that uh, it's all becoming so uh, uh, you know, uh, simple to to turn it on, QC it. You know, we have sorters that basically do all the alignment and, and what have you for you. The, the QC is pretty much all automated uh, and the costs are coming down. So I think of the cytometers is probably uh, making themselves and they, they are certainly doing this now um, where they're in, in many labs, but being run by people that really don't know what they're doing. And so I, I think a big challenge is on the educational front, um, just uh, ensuring that the type of the type of quality data that comes out of flow cytometry may, remains remains high. One of the I talked about the multi-myeloma and are trying to standardize that assay. One of the things that I think um, uh, flow suffers from is that we're all a bunch of cowboys. Um, I Peter, I don't know what assays you develop, but I can assure you that any assay I develop was better than anybody else's. Period. <laughs> uh, so they should be doing my assay. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that I, I'm probably not unique in that attitude. And so we all have different ways of doing something that is similar and the results are just a little bit different. So when, um, we send out a, a zap 70 result on a sample to a doc, they get one, one answer. Um, they send it to another lab, they get a completely different answer so that, uh, people who, who see more and more of the data become less convinced about uh, less convinced about the data. So it scares me a little bit that as these instruments are going into uh, labs that really don't, you know, they're, they're more focused on something else um, that uh, that won't be the quality data that, uh, that we see. So I think maintaining the standards is probably the biggest challenge. I think that's a, an excellent answer. And on that note, Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm sorry. I. I there's so much more I wanted to ask, but I do appreciate it. we have to, to wrap it up. And obviously, thank you for everyone for watching or listening. And please go and watch 
some of the other flow stars past and coming up uh, and i hope you've enjoyed it so paul thank you very much uh, peter thank you very much for uh, you brought back some memories that uh I haven't I haven't thought about in a long time and a couple couple questions I needed to really think about. I'm still not sure about the Star Wars answer, but we'll we'll deal with that at another time. <laughs> I'm sure it will be fine. <laughs> Thank you.